Welcome to the podcast. My name is Father Bill W. I'm an Episcopal priest and I live here in Austin, Texas. So if the background is a little bit different today, it's because I'm out visiting my son and his family in Reno, Nevada, uh, having a really, really wonderful time. And um, so welcome back. Um, the idea behind these podcasts is to try to go deeper into the history, spirituality, psychology, uh, of a uh, program of Alcoholics Anonymous and uh, touch on a number of different subjects. Uh, this one, we're uh, going into uh, men and their emotions. This is the second episode in the series that we're doing. And Men and Emotions is also the title of uh, a new book that is written by my guest, Laura Swan. And Laura holds a master's degree in education uh, and is also a licensed uh, chemical dependency counselor. She teaches at several colleges and universities uh, in the Austin area. And in addition to um, her background in uh, chemical dependency work, uh, she's done a lot of specialization in the areas of trauma, a kind of a new model of therapy, we might call it. Laura, welcome back. It's good, good to have you uh, back on the, on the podcast. Thank you so much, Bill. Excited to be here for episode number two. Off, off we go. Off, off we go. We go. <laughs> All right. So let's let's uh, let's dig in here now. Um, let's see. Uh, in writing your book, uh, you say that you I think it was somewhere over four hundred people that you interviewed it, interviewed, and it wasn't just men, uh, but it was also a number of women. You studying um, authors and. Uh, the whole subject of men and their emotional lives. So let's let's begin with breaking maybe some of the uh, cultural or discussing rather some of the cultural norms, rules, and stereotypes that you found in uh, in doing your studies. Yeah, for sure. I think doing my men's group, I became very aware of some of those stereotypes and some of the cultures that made it difficult for men, and. I became really curious about just the general population. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? What do other people think? I mean, because I felt like I was in a bit of a, you know, little bubble with my practice. So I got really curious about, you know, what's it like outside? So it started, you know, with just friends. I started asking friends. The phrase that I use is, what's the first thing that comes to mind when I say men and emotions? Mm -hmm. And then they provided feedback. And it turned into 423 responses. And um, I mean, it was pretty 50-50 in terms of gender. Oh, was and, it really? That, that, that yeah, it was close. that close. I didn't it was, know that. Yeah, I think it was like 46 and, you know, um, 50, whatever that other is. Four. 54. 54 yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Had to do quick math. <laughs> yeah. 54. So it was, you know, very close in terms of the gender. And I really worked on asking people outside of Austin, outside of Texas. Mm -hmm. I asked people really all over the 50 states and um, everybody was pretty much fair game. I would ask people in the grocery store. I would ask my friends to ask their friends. I would ask old friends that I've had that had moved out of state, and then they'd ask their friends and family. So anyway, I gathered that data, and it was very interesting. 86% of the respondent responded with something that was in the vein of men have a hard time articulating and identifying their feeling. And that was um, demonstrated by words like, Lock without a key, physical pain before emotional pain, um, don't want to do it, cry babies. Um, there were tons of adjectives um, about how men, you know, um, how people saw men in their responding. And then from there, I took that information and just got more curious about what does that look like for um, men in terms of the stereotypes. And um, I checked it out with some of my men's group, um, some of the members of my men's group. So I think it really is a um, pretty good representation of the challenges that men face um, with, you know, 
articulating and identifying their emotions. Right, and and they're subject uh, to a bunch of rules and uh, societal norms that uh, they're expected to fulfill, eh? Uh, right. Growing up, what what are those like? What are those like? Um, you know, I think that that from what I have experienced, I mean, I haven't experienced it as a man, obviously, but um, you know, what I have experienced from talking to men, um, you know, it's challenging because you know, if they they'll say things like, you know, if I did that. Um, whoever would get upset or I would look weak or I would look less than or I would look um, not strong. I think the biggest thing and the biggest surprise in all of that information and gathering that data and working in the, with the men's group was what I found was that men just didn't have a opinion. They didn't have anywhere to do that. And growing up and in their adult life, um, men are... You know, it's different than women that are tend to be a little bit more social and might get together more. Mm -hmm. They're and more even, verbal as well, aren't they? They. I mean, I've noticed yeah. that with my with my grandkids. The boys, the boys are much slower in developing their linguistic skills. Yes, yeah. I think. Yeah, I think women are more verbal. But right. you know, then we go back to that question: Is that nature nurture? And is that kind of how we were designed differently, or are those the stereotypes and what we, um, what men bump into, um, you know, throughout their whole life? What if there there wasn't as much um, for men to contend with in this arena? And what if they had platform? Would that look different? One of the things you get to uh, early in this second second chapter, I think we are in the book, is that there's a myth that women are more emotional than men, and it isn't true. Is am I, am I right in that? That's what the findings show. Yes, absolutely. That they experience emotions internally at the same level. So men and women experience, experience um, emotions uh, equally. Uh, Yes, but but men saying those verbally, articulating them out loud, that is way lower than how women um, express. Yeah, so so equal in experience, not equal in expression. Exactly, that's perfect. That's the formula, right? Eh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm yep. still working on expressing mine. So yeah. <laughs> well, and a lot of it, Bill, too, is having permission to do that. Because now, I mean, the men, whether I'm working with them in individual therapy or in the men's group, they know that they have permission to express. And my, the men in my group really have no trouble articulating, no right. more trouble than women articulating their emotions. Um, that group has been together for a while, and they know each other well. Mm -hmm. um, but now that they're, you know, established, they really don't have a hard time articulating um, their emotion. They've been given permission. They've been given permission to do that. They have right. a platform. They have a place to do that, that they feel safe, right. that they're not going to be judged, that they're not going to be looked at as weak or less than. Well, that's one of the beauties of 12-step recovery, isn't it? I mean, for many of us, it's it's the first introduction uh, to a world where it's okay to tell the truth. It's okay to be confused. It's okay to go to these places where the emotions reside and, and do the best you can at getting them out, you know? And the more one struggles with it, the more behind <laughs> that person everybody in the group is. Yes. You know? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. amazing. I've, I've taken a number. I took a psychiatrist once to a 12-step meeting. She was a woman. Uh, I was working out in Arizona. And, and it was the first 12-step meeting she had been to. She was in tears. Hi. She in went. tears in, in terms of the honesty that she was finding. Uh, all of these things that you're talking about, the, the freedom to express what's going on. 
they were tears of joy in a sense, but I think she was quite blown away. Yeah. I was blown away, yeah. but, you know, as I was so guarded, so protective of, of what's happening in my inner world. And these people seem to be, have gone down there and uh, gotten comfortable with it. And now they're able to talk about it. It's amazing. Right. It is amazing. amazing. Well, and it's like you and I've talked about both kind of our family background right. and gro growing up in a house that didn't have permission. Um, we don't talk about those things. No. no. I mean, and you know, those four, the three rules of don't talk, don't trust, don't feel. Right. I mean, those are um, those three rules that go to pretty much every alcoholic home or right. um, families with, um, you know, addiction. So, yeah, I mean, when you learn and find a place you can do it, it is pretty overwhelming. The last podcast I shared about the, my first meeting and walking mm -hmm. in there, and like I said, I had those tears, too. I was so overwhelmed that somebody was talking about that, and they were telling my story, and it was so, you yeah. know, so relieving to hear that because I had so much bottled up inside mm -hmm. that it was, um, by the time I could finally talk, it just felt so good. I love tears at a meeting. It's a, that's a good meeting. Yeah, <laughs> some, it some is. Something good's going on. You talk about emotional intelligence. What does that phrase mean? Emotional intelligence, I use that quite a bit um, in, with the men that I work with because I do believe it's a little bit more cerebral than maybe some of the other stuff that we have, you know, worked with around emotions. And I like it because the men seem to connect to it really well. Emotional intelligence is measured in a, a similar way of IQ. Yeah. And for a long time, you know, um, experts felt like IQ was kind of the end-all, be-all that determines whether someone's going to be successful or not. There were several um, individuals that coined this phrase. Um, I talk about it in the book quite a bit, but they coined the phrase of emotional intelligence. And then shortly after, a gentleman, um, Daniel Goldman, um, wrote a book called Emotional Intelligence. And mm -hmm. it's a great book. It's really um, gives a great description and kind of goes into depth about um, the what um, um, emotional intelligence is and how we apply it. But basically, emotional intelligence includes um, way more than just IQ. It includes our ability to um, recognize our own emotions. It includes the ability to recognize emotions in others. Mm. It includes being able to um, regulate our emotions at appropriate right. times. Um, so it has a lot to do with both our inside, the inside, and right the outside of um, how we, you know, manage or demonstrate emotions. Right, right, because uh, it, it's not always appropriate to be expressing your emotions. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, it, it, you know, you have, you, you have to know how to, how to navigate uh, the outer world as well as the inner world. Yes. Well, now okay. what they're finding, too, with this emotional intelligence, and there's a lot of companies that I was just speaking with a friend of mine who is um, a vice chancellor of a university, and they're hiring some, you know, high-level administrative people, and they are requiring anybody applying for the position to do an EQ, emotional intelligence, mm. um, test, because it demonstrates so much around leadership, our sure. ability, our ability to get along with um, others, right. work in groups, um, you know. So, and I know there's a lot of companies that are really looking more and more at emotional intelligence, and I do believe it's one of the reasons that some of the universities are beginning to drop some of the uh, mm -hmm. entrance exam, right? You know, because they're they're realizing, you know, an IQ is not um, it is part of the equation, and it's important. It is, but it is just one piece of the equation, and emotional intelligence is another piece that is, um, I mean, some people say, honestly, it's more important than the IQ. Right. 
Uh, talk to just a little bit, we're kind of on this subject now, the, uh, the difference between mental health and emotional health. Sure. There again, you know, it's kind of like the, we talked about last week, emotions and feelings. Um, they're so similar. Mm. Um, and most of the time they get grouped together. And it's similar with emotional mental health, but um, emotional and mental health, the difference is emotional health is establishing what's inside of us, the emotions inside of us, how we are feeling with the emotions. Mental health is also inside, but it is more cerebral. It's what we are thinking. Mm -hmm. It's what we are experiencing through our thoughts. Right. Which, whereas the emotional is more um, gut. It is yeah. um, the feeling. I was just thinking when, when you were talking, so emotionally, if I'm in touch with my emotions, I, I'm feeling things that are going on. Uh, I, I use shadow as, uh, as one of the things uh, in, in my own training uh, for, for the, what's happening in the unconscious. Uh, and, and some of the things that are happening in the unconscious It'd be it'd be crazy to start blurting those out in a, in a <laughs> yeah. you know uh, yeah. when I'm at a job interview you know I actually did once it was kind of funny I was uh, I was in the final stages of going through sort of the gauntlet that you have to run in the in the Episcopal Church to get ordained so the last the last little gauntlet was the executive committee that the bishop has and this is to make sure that they don't ordain a, a uh, an absolute nut, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's their yeah. role. Is this one just not <laughs> crazy? That's, that's, that's all they want to know. And, and for some reason, you know, they, uh, and I told them, well, I'm going to be working with alcoholics and addicts. I'm kind of a specialized ministry. They said, uh, you know, if you're looking for a guy in the parish, I'm not your man. And one woman said, well, Bill, do you plan to wear the collar when you're doing your ministry? And I, my response was, I don't know where it came from. I said, well, I said, probably only if I'm being arrested. <laughs> uh, that's kind of funny, Bill. It is kind of funny. And, uh, and, and I mean, I guess my, uh, my little joker inside thought that was quite humorous. She did not. Um, you know? So I, yeah. had to I had to clean it up, clear it up. Uh, I don't know if I was tired or relaxed or what was going on. But there's a perfect example of my emotional thing that's going on inside of me. I want to play. I'm not in a setting where they're into play. You know, oh, yes. they're very a, serious. Yes, oh. <laughs> that's a great observation, you know, and great yeah. awareness on your part, for sure. Because yeah. I think it, sometime or another, we've all done that. And oh, yeah. th then we've seen the reaction on the other person's face or the committee or whoever it is. And we're like, oh, wait, that wasn't that they weren't thinking the same. They way weren't there. They, they, yeah. they, were, they were not <laughs> yeah. on that channel. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's uh, right. OK. Uh, you you talk, also talk uh, about uh, accessing something called the wise mind. What does that entail for you? And, and then I'll talk about what it entails for me. It may, it may be very different, but uh, it reminded me of two-way prayer. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I'd, li I'd love to hear about that. Yeah. Um, the wise mind, so we do have, you know, our cerebral, and then we have this emotional um, place. Lots of times, especially for people in recovery, those two are, I call it a bit of a wrestling match. Those two can be in a bit of a wrestling match where the head is saying one thing and the heart is saying something else. And the reason that happens in recovery is because most of the time I've not met one client or one person it, that comes into recovery that has a good relationship with their emotions. Pretty much everybody that I've ever worked with um, or known has been disconnected from their emotions. So they're just starting to get in touch with their emotions. And in terms of their emotional intelligence or their emotional maturity, it yeah. may be pretty um, immature. And so right. their head may be telling them something, 
but their emotions are st um, come, starting to come up and they don't have substances anymore to help keep those emotions down or to numb those or make them go away. So they're in a, this bit of a wrestling match. It's best if our head and heart line up. It doesn't always happen, but it's best. And the right. wise mind, the wise mind is accessing both our cerebral and our emotions in any given situation. So we don't want to completely act out of this emotional place where the emotions are 100% driving the bus. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to act out of this emotional place where the emotions are 100% driving the bus. We want to be able to consider the thoughts, the facts, because the cerebral part gives us facts and they give us data. Right. And that's Whereas important. The, that's important. Yes, it's yeah. very important. Right. And um, the emotional part helps us connect. It gives us the joy. It helps us feel. It helps us, you know, um, enjoy something like it. So when those two line up, we have information from both that are that's going to help us make a more informed and good decision for ourselves. So the the uh, emotional component is is more tied in with the unconscious mind. Would you say it could be? Um, so could act actually some of the thoughts. Um, you know, until. That's why, and we'll talk about this probably a little today, um, that's why the first two of the nine principles talk about being aware and being mindful. So much of our world is unconscious unless we are mindful and aware, right? Yes. Okay. So when we become aware of something and we're mindful about it, then it's no longer unconscious to it. That's right. Well, the unconscious has become conscious. Yes. Which is, which is what, what the unconscious wants to do. And, and to the degree that the, the manner in which we treat the unconscious, Jung says, is the way the unconscious will treat us as well. Right. So there is a reciprocity there that's going on, a dialogue, if you will, certainly an addiction. I mean, one of the things I had... This was a this was so important to me for I don't know maybe a, a year eighteen months I'm not sure how long it was, but I was ashamed that I had a desire to drink, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't talk to people about that because mm -hmm. I thought that well that's so wrong. I mean I'm in AA I'm trying to get sober uh, I should be a good little boy, but a part of me wanted to you know just go wild. And and I wasn't, and that was the way I, I was able to go wild. And mm hey, -hmm. normality was boring in some ways. Where's the fun? Boy, you bring up such an excellent point because the unconscious, we tend to push down a lot of uncomfortable feelings that we don't like. You talked about, I was ashamed, I was embarrassed, I didn't want to do that. Well, of course you don't want those feelings coming up. And of course you don't want to own those feelings because that if you owned them, then you're going to feel your shame. Then you're going to feel the embarrassment. If you talked about them, you'd even feel more embarrassment or more shame. And I'm letting my sponsor down and letting all these people down. But Absolutely. I'm denying a truth at the same time. And that's where it's really important to know the right place and the yeah, right time right. and that's the right. right person that's to right. share that with and to be honest with yourself. Um, and also not afraid of some of those thoughts. I mean, it happens a lot. Is It, it happens a lot when um, clients are working on some of their family of origin or trauma, trauma stuff, because right. they stuff it down and... The, what they're trying to avoid is the emotions that are connected to that trauma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because if they start talking about that trauma or dealing with that trauma, they're going to experience those emotions that 
are connected to that. Right. And, and I don't know anyone who escapes childhood without trauma. <laughs> I know it's pretty. I mean, I suppose they're out there. I suppose they're out there, but, but the ones who say they did, as I, as I get to know them better, they didn't. <laughs> well, and it's interesting because I'm curious about that. Too. I, I've always been curious about that, but I believe that you and I work in a world where um, 99.9% <laughs> of the people we work with have experienced trauma at some yeah. level and especially yeah. through their substance use dependence because that it's messy i mean the things that end up happening in that disease are incredibly messy so um that's that can be really difficult but i do believe that there are people with maybe less trauma or oh, less absolutely. intensity sure. or yeah. less you know um, yes. I just they think weren't that, in my neighborhood, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I, was, I was in New York City, you know, yeah, was kind yeah. of a street kid. So yeah. Anyway, you discuss in your book uh, why it is we have emotions. I thought this was this was interesting. Why why are they there? You know, know. what's their function? What's their function? <laughs> I, I harp on this a lot. I okay, do. good. I well, do harp, harp away. On this. Harp, harp away. away. No, I do because um, I think. So many people want to avoid it, right? right? What's what's the point? Why do we do this? When we have a really good relationship with our emotions, they become our compass. They give us direction. They tell us what's going on. They tell us if we need to fight or flight. They tell us if we need to um, not say an offhanded comment in a Episcopal interview. Right. <laughs> Um, right. sometimes, sometimes, sometimes yeah. yeah, um, but they, they provide, um, wisdom and knowledge books. That's one of the reasons. The other one that I really, for me, cause I'm such a connector. I love connecting with people is through our emotions. We connect with other people. It is through our emotions. And I mean, if that woman in that first meeting I had ever been to, if she didn't share um, about her um, experience and share some emotions, what um, I wouldn't have connected with. What connected us was the commonality of our emotions and exper of the experience in, of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You join at the heart level. Abs yes, you join, at the, join at the heart level and yeah. connection, you know, there's lots of ways to connect um, and it doesn't always have to be through deep conversations. I mean, people can connect in lots of different ways, but verbally is one of the most powerful when we allow ourselves to be vulnerable and we allow ourselves to be seen there the connection is can be so much deeper than other type of experiences that kind of leads into into the area of sexual addiction it's it's like if individuals that is the only way they know how to connect and 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 there's some truth to that with the drinking i i i i distrust you if you are not a drinker if I'm going to be able to connect with you, it's on the basis of a shared addiction of some sort. Urban. Very difficult yeah. to come out of that, isn't it? It can be. Yeah, yeah. it definitely can because it's the only way that, or maybe it's what one you know. of very it's the world you know. Yeah. Yes, yeah. it is a, most of the most common, most comfortable right. way that somebody knows how to connect with somebody else, whether it's through a sexual experience right. or whether it's through drinking or using, uh, you know, some for, um, form of drug or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so being in touch with our emotions, and I think uh, you say in the book, this is true for men as well as for women. It, it, it's not just one over the other, the payoffs, you know, um, kind of, started into a discussion of this, but uh, 
the the real payoffs are are what if i've got these two two worlds in sync the biggest payoff yeah would be that when we can be seen mm -hmm. for our true self yes our authentic self right the connection with that person is um like no other connection yeah um it's hard to go through the world and like you were saying you were, gave such a good example about um i didn't want anybody to know i was having all these thoughts right that's a hard secret that's a hard thing to hold it was like when i was growing up in the dyslexia and i made that conscious decision nobody's ever going to see this. Right. i'm going to cover this i'm going to um not let anybody know and i learned a lot of coping skills that were not very healthy to be able to cover that up and nobody was able to see that part of me which was very lonely very uncomfortable um so misunderstood yes. and it causes a lot of friction and a lot of negative and en negative energy within my body mm -hmm. that's back to the emotions and the feelings uh, yes, yeah. absolutely. So yeah. that's one of the payoffs is, um, you know, being able to be seen in our authentic self. Um, now, we don't do that across the board. Like you said, people right. at work may not know. Right. What's appropriate? What, right. what and where is it appropriate to do this? Absolutely. Where yes. is it safe? Where is it safe yes. to do this? Yeah. Well, where is it not safe and I'm willing to... Uh, to move forward in my discomfort. I'm okay enough within me that if, if, if the environment is not there, it's still okay. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes, it does make sense. Yeah, yes. Yeah. It's a risk. The it's risk, risk goes up because anytime we become vulnerable, right. it's risk with, that, with uncertainty, right? That's right. And so if we are not sure what the other person is how they're going to respond, what that's going to look like, if we'll be rejected, the uncertainty goes up and the risk is greater. We're putting ourselves at risk for um, rejection, misunderstanding, or, you know, however um, that ends. And sometimes it doesn't end. Right. But if you're free enough to do that, you know, mm -hmm. and, and wise enough, to do it in the appropriate setting. And this is this is where I was, I was talking earlier about the two-way prayer. This is where the guidance piece can come in. You know, and, and, and uh, Jung, Jung talked about, the, you know, the inner wise man or the inner wise woman. It's, it's like, it's, it's like these, these archetypal entities within us who know more than we know and, and can guide us. Let's go right to the nine principles because uh, we're kind of, kind of getting a little short on time and I want to have, have time to get to these. These are nine principles that you talk about in chapter three that uh, are helpful uh, to pay close attention to. And, and I, if you would, I'd like you to walk us through what each of these nine are. And I will read the, the, each one. And, and then if you just comment briefly. Uh, as to what's going on here. Well, why did you include this one? So number one, take ownership of our emotions. Yeah, and I'm going to back up one second and just um, one clarifying statement, and that is these nine principles are um, principles that help us get in touch with our feelings, okay. understand our feelings, and be able to articulate our feelings. So the this People ask me, how do I do that? How do I get in touch with my emotions? How do I know, um, you know, what to do? So these nine principles are um, principles that help us do that. Okay. So okay. tick off those three again to, to do what? To understand? To identify. Identify. Yeah. Identify our emotions. Um, understand. Understand the understand emotions. Them and then be able to articulate them. And be able to articulate them. Okay, got yes. it. Yes. Okay. Yep. 
So then number one, take ownership of our emotions. Take ownership. Take ownership is like anything, right, Bill? Mm -hmm. I mean, when we take ownership of anything that we do, the outcome is always better. And so it is literally about being aware of it might be someone who's been in recovery for a while and they um, say to themselves, I am so, I'm learning that I'm disconnected from my feelings and I just don't have any, like, I don't know how to do that. I'm just really lost. And so the ownership would look something like, um, I want to learn more. I am committed to doing this. I'm committed to do the work. I'm committing to find out more. One of the things I thought of was, was taking ownership of, of what's going on inside of me. I may not understand it, but there, there's a lo lovely expression, you know, and, and, and the drunks and addicts will be very familiar with it. Oh, excuse me, honey. I just wasn't myself last night. <laughs> or you say to the boss, I just wasn't myself, uh, you know, the other uh -huh. day in that meeting. And, and, and one therapist said, well, if you weren't yourself, who the hell were you? <laughs> yeah, I was myself. Yeah. But i am it's a part of myself that I'm not aware of, comfortable right. with, have owner, and I'm not going to take ownership of it. Yeah. You know, let's just bury yeah. that sucker once again. It wasn't yeah. me. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> There's a one of the gentlemen who wrote for the book um, describes this so perfectly, and I'll read this little excerpt from okay, his, good. from his deal. He said, "Emotions in the past were and still are at times disregarded and un unimportant to me. The majority of my life, I thought it was a strength to be aloof and not care." Yeah. Then he goes on to say, I'm beginning to understand that my feelings are not something to be ignored, but rather a source of insight into my inner working. Mm -hmm. His reflection is a great example of taking ownership of this is how it used to be. And this is what I this is where I'm going. And even to be confused, this is where I am now. And sure. I don't fully understand it. Yeah, but this is where I want to go, and I don't need to know all the information. I just nice. know that this way, the old way, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like when you first start, you know, any type of recovery program, right? Um, the drinking, whatever, the drugs, the um, behavior addiction, whatever it is, wasn't working anymore. Right. And then trying to figure out, okay, now what works? You don't step into the room knowing everything. Oh, my gosh, it takes years and years and years to understand recovery. And, and the same you'd say is true with my emotional world. I'm not going to read a book and I got it. No, no. It is a journey. And I think it we ebb and flow. I think there are times that we are much more taking ownership and aware. And then we get really busy and we kind of forget about things and we're not aware and we're not practicing the nine principles. It's no different than... Our, a good parallel is our physical um, health. And think about like working out. Um, a person works out for three or four months and consistently and regularly taking care of their physical health. And then they don't because they get really busy or something mm -hmm. happens and they're not able to do it anymore. And then they begin to see um, what happens when they don't? Yeah, and then muscle, they, muscles atrophy. They start that they muscles start. atrophy. Yeah, very things quickly. Things change. Very Balance quickly. goes away. All yeah. kinds of things can shift, and so they begin exercising again. Same thing. I think it ebbs and ebb and flows. That emotional health, just like um, other areas, our spiritual health, right? Our you know mental health. It, it ebbs and flows. Nobody gets on this train and yeah. just rides a linear yeah. path. Okay, number two, pay attention to them. Watchfulness, mindfulness. Mindfulness. Everybody, yeah. you know, mindfulness, big word, but really all it is, mindfulness is just paying attention, yeah. being aware <laughs> of um, how am I feeling. It's not that we are mindful 24-7 and we're right. constantly, oh, how do I feel? How do I feel now? How do I feel now? Yeah. It's not that. 
is just checking in with yourself. Right. Um, and checking and in with your higher power as well. You know, you, yes. you ain't going to stay connected all day long. Right. You know, you're going to fall asleep. You're going to lose yes. the conscious contact, you know, yes. but you're going to come back. Uh -huh. And and that's, that's the exercise is, is the coming back. Right. And being mindful and noticing, you know, sometimes one of the best ways to notice is our physical self. Like we might have a churning in the stomach. We might get uncomfortable. We might start feeling anxious. Those are signs that we need to stop and pay attention. You might be restless, irritable, filled with discontent. And discontent. <laughs> it's not a bad thing. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an indicator going on inside that I have strayed from where I need to be. Come back. The purpose of emotions. Come back. One, one of the reasons that we have oh. emotions. Oh, okay. That's a good point. That's a very good point. That, that, they, that they tell me something. Yeah, it's a knocking at the door. It's a knocking at the door. Hey, something's going on here. You need to listen. And what happens is when we hear that knock on the door yeah. and we push it down, the right. knock gets louder. They're banging on the door. They're and beating they're the door down Nick. after a while. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, I've been there. Got, got it, got it. A practice experience, the number three, practice experiencing these emotions without judgment. Yeah, I could spend an entire podcast because who doesn't judge their feelings? Yes. And judgment of feelings is exactly what you described earlier in the podcast. I don't want to right. tell my um, sponsor this. I don't want to talk about this in a meeting. Why? Because you feel like you might be, you might experience those emotions of being ashamed or embarrassed right. or you're doing something wrong. Let them down. That let them down. All of those all emotions. All stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So practice so, doing it. Yeah. So judgment is a really big piece. The thing to know about judgment is that when we are in judgment, any processing of feelings really gets stymied. So it, we really can't process our emotions when we're in judgment because we're so worried about how we are going to manage that so nobody can see what's actually going on, that we're stuck in that um, circle versus um, just being able to be with our emotions and letting them process, mm -hmm. letting them pass. Eckhart Tolle it can be helpful to many people with this, huh? Uh, living in the now. Yeah. You know, moment to moment. I can get through this moment. Mm -hmm. uh, don't don't even look an hour down the down the pike. It's too mm -hmm. much. Yeah. It can be too much. Well, and it's hard for a person new in recovery, Bill, because uh, they've maybe gone from very little emotion mm -hmm. to a whole bunch of emotion. Yeah, over, and so, overwhelmed, yeah. Yes, and think about, I mean, if you are taught as a child mm -hmm. how to deal with emotion, you're taught more age-appropriate. Mm -hmm. So now you are this adult and you're in recovery and you've gone from, you know, not having much emotion because you've yeah. been stuffing, drinking, whatever you're doing, to having a lot of emotion that is really difficult um, to deal with. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you earlier, and, and I, I didn't, but uh, some people say, you know, our emotional growth stops with addiction uh, so that we, where we should have grown through experiences, we short circuit that process. Uh, and we drink instead, we uh, drug instead, we, we eat instead. And, and so when we do get uh, into recovery, emotionally, we're very immature. It, truth to that, would you say? Yeah, it, definitely truth to that, but it stunts all areas. I mean, so many times, and I talked about this on the last podcast, mm -hmm. I have so many students that return as a non-traditional students because they burn so many 
bridges, right. cerebral, cognitive, school, in that area. I've not met very many people that come into recovery that have a good relationship with their spiritual self or their social self. I think in addiction, especially in the latter stages, severe, I think you're really losing contact with all parts of ourselves. Did we do four permission? No. Did we didn't. Let, well, let's 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 hit the permission switch there. <laughs> let's hit the permission. <laughs> Giving ourselves permission to have um, emotions is huge. I don't know how you eventually got to that spot, Bill, when you were struggling with all of the emotions you were having about mm -hmm. the drinking. But when we can give ourselves permission. I give myself permission to experience these feelings. I give myself permission to talk to someone about these feelings. Right. I give myself permission to journal about my feelings. Mm -hmm. Permission is just a mindful practice, so it's very connected to the right. two and three, and it's just a mindful practice. Um, Brene Brown and her work, and I use what she calls or she coined the term and i use it all the time permission slip and they're little sticky notes and i'll have a client write their self permission for a certain act when we take it from inside and put it outside and then put that sticky note where we see that it becomes more conscious again right and so it might be I give myself permission to experience these feelings and write about in my journal yeah. over the weekend. I am not responsible for the emotion that uh, comes up within me. Is that that's correct? Is it not? I mean, it's just there. There it is. Yes, you are responsible <laughs> when it comes up. Well, for what I do next, what I do next. Yes. Yes. But not right. for it's coming up. No, no. You yeah. are not. You can't control that. See, and that's, you asked earlier, what did I do with that thing? Mm -hmm. what, what I did with that was I learned what, what it really means to have an unmanageable life. Mm -hmm. I'm powerless mm -hmm. over alcohol. I got mm -hmm. that. I'm yeah. powerless over this stuff. What does it mean to have an unmanageable life? It means it means that that other part of of the addiction circle that it's not only you know uh, an allergy of the body but it's an obsession of the mind. Mm -hmm. That's and 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 the mind will will be obsessed. Now I notice it. I'm not responsible for that being there. I become responsible for what I do with it afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, feelings are going to come up. They're going to come up. They're going to come up. And our thoughts, same thing with our thoughts. I mean, there they are. Know, <laughs> there they are. <laughs> and I mean, every single person on this planet can relate to um, having some negative thoughts about self or negative thoughts about their sure. job or yeah. cre creating this huge story that doesn't really yeah. even exist. Right. Um, you know, we can all relate to that. Right. So, but we are responsible, um, you know, it's like the hamster in the wheel. And we're responsible to either stop the wheel and apply our principles right. so that the next right thing to do is not to brood, which right. brooding is spending hours and hours and hours. Very familiar territory. Very familiar. <laughs> and right. the story gets bigger. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It doesn't help. It no, does not it doesn't help. help. And then it, it leads into resentment, right? Right. Yeah. There we go. Uh, get curious about our emotions. I like this one. Get How curious easy. about them. I know. Getting curious is great. That's a fun getting one. Yeah. It's, it's getting curious about anything is, is good because all we're doing is wanting to know more information, right? So um, I... With my clients, and I talk about this in the book, I do the what if questions or the why questions. So I'll have clients say, um, I'm curious about why I feel a particular way. Again, not to judge, 
we're not to get an answer. This is not yet. All we're doing here is getting curious, not finding answers, not finding solution yet. We just want to find out more information. So what we're doing is what we talked about earlier, Bill, we're bringing the unconscious into our conscious because there's lots of little pieces of that feeling that we probably haven't identified or um, allowed ourselves to really think about. When, when I teach people about two-way prayer and really going deeper, uh, when an emotion comes up or um, a feeling, uh, who are you? What, what are you here to tell me? And then dialogue mm -hmm, with that mm -hmm, feeling mm -hmm. or that, that emotion. Let it speak back to you. Let that, and you don't know what it's going to say. And that's a marvelous uh, method for the allowing the unconscious to become conscious. That's a beautiful way to get curious about your feelings. Yeah. Yeah. So any what if, any why questions, um, how? But again, no judgment and no answers at this point. Yeah. Just yeah. get curious. And, and, and let them speak in an appropriate manner. And I love what you said about, what are you here to tell me? My thing is they have a gift. <laughs> you, let's, let's take rage, <laughs> you know? Um, it, yeah. I mean, you want to push it down. You don't want to own it. You want to get rid of it. It's, but it, it, underneath it, there's a gift. Now, you may have to do some serious digging, and it may take you a long while to get appropriate with it. But it's it's something inside of me that that maybe maybe is going to open up how rageful I was at five or six years old, and could not go there. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't safe. Was not safe. Yeah, and I think that's another point in that because we've talked so much about appropriateness. Right. That's why therapy, the men's group, hopefully a really good sponsor. Having, you know, um, someone in your life that's very important yeah. where you can be that raw. That's right. And you can say maybe the things that you're not going to say to, you know, more people at the Christmas dinner or and, the, you know. And, and I, would throw, I would throw God into that category just as much. Well, you know? how so? What do you mean? Well, I mean to be able to say... Uh, Oh, what you want and to do, what, yeah. What's going on with me? <laughs> what the hell is this about? <laughs> you know? I'm really angry about this. And Be I honest think, about it. I think God loves it when we're that honest. Absolutely. I don't think, Absolutely. you know. He, um, he's probably not too crazy about, about what's happening either. <laughs> yes, probably not. But Did the I, best I, I could. I don't know. <laughs> I love that you made that, you know, distinction um, uh -huh. or that point, because I do think that that's so important. That honesty, that relationship in our spiritual life, it, you know, is essential. It's absolutely essential be, be, because the same thing that we're talking about, covering up, stuffing it down, same thing happens at, uh, you know, at, at, at the, lo the level of our relationship with God, you know. I mean, my wife did a, an interesting thing. She'll kill me for saying this. Uh, but boy, this, this was, you know, 50 some odd years ago, 55 years ago, I guess. Uh, the way she got introduced to her higher power was she kind of went, went into a room and used every four letter word she knew <laughs> and then said, OK, who's ever left? Let's let's you and I do business together, you know, to God. <laughs> she found it. She, <laughs> Uh, process of good. elimination. There. That's right. Whoever's <laughs> left there, let's 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 do business now. Yeah. Uh, name naming our emotions and feelings. Uh, we don't even have the the right titles for many of them. Yep. Ignorant. Name it to tame it. Yeah. Um, Dan Siegel coined that term, and um, when we can name our emotion, um, it helps us move through it. One of the things that I did early in um, my recovery was I got a feelings chart and I would recommend, I mean, those are a dime a dozen on the, um, 
website on any, you know, on the internet. We'll put a but, link to, we'll put a link to one in the show notes. Okay. Okay. And I a have good, a link in the book too. Well, send it to me and I'll put it in the show notes if you got a good okay, one. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I can do that. I would recommend not doing one with, I mean, a huge one with a million feet rings on okay. it because it's so overwhelming. Yeah. Just be simple. And, you know, get one, maybe 20, 25 feelings on it. And yeah, that's it's enough. probably going to identify something yeah. that you're feeling. Okay. So getting a chart is incredibly helpful, really helpful. for naming. Really helpful. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, check the facts. This is number seven. Check the facts. Check the facts. We always want to check the facts because many times with our emotions, we make up stories and we mm. add little pieces to those stories. So. Oh, yeah. You know, um, I walk out of my boss's office and I think to myself, God, that didn't go so well. Uh, it, it didn't feel like it went so well. And then I walk out and I go back to my um, office and I'm thinking to myself, what did I say wrong? What did I do? Did I did blah, blah. I wonder if she didn't like this that I did last week. We start questioning and sure. then I start making up stories that aren't necessarily true, or I don't have facts too. Right. And so I have to check the fact. How did that sound to you? How get get some feedback from some other people? Yeah. Feedback is always good. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's just stopping the story making. Yeah. And um, letting the situation unravel. Right. And seeing if there's any more data that will support, you know, that. So checking the facts is important because we can definitely make up stories that um, are not, you know, um, don't help the situation. Okay, number eight, regulate our emotions and feelings. Mo um, emotion regulation is a... Um, more high level skill and early in recovery, you know, many people don't have a lot of emotion regulation. And we think about this as a person, you know, um, raging or spewing mm. the word I use uh, or, yeah. you know, going all over, but it can also be a person who chooses not to share their emotions at all. Mm -hmm. That's not healthy regulation. Right. When you um, isolate or go in a corner or don't um, communicate to your partner what's happening, that's as a, um, unhealthy as the spewing. Both of those, they're either ends of the spectrum, and mm -hmm. neither one of those are healthy in relationships or within ourselves. So... We'll talk more um, a lot because emotion regulation is a really important skill to be able to function in life okay. and in relationships. Okay, so because, we'll get in, into this in some later chapters. Yes, more we intensely. Will, yeah, and I'll definitely bring it up again because okay. um, it is, you know, growing up in a house with a lot of trauma or growing mm. up with addiction. Right. Um, we don't learn a lot of self-soothing. And mm -hmm. those are important skills that we learn from very, very small, hopefully from infancy. When we are upset, when we're cry, when, when it, something happens, we learn how to self-soothe. And for people in recovery, it is, a, again, their maturation may be stymied a bit. And it's the relearning of, how do I self-soothe when I get really worked up, when I really feel like I want to go use, when I get really angry and I want to go rage? How do I soothe that and not act on that? How do I let it not take me, take, um, oh. Right. Very good. And, and, and the same is true for the, the final one, number nine, uh, build a toolbox of strategies to help manage our emotions and feelings. And we're going to go deeper, we're going to go deeper, a lot deeper into eight and nine, I think, in our next episode. But maybe just briefly on the the toolbox, could you comment on that? Yeah, the next chapter, the following chapter, I've included a lot of strategies um, 
that a person can put in their toolbox and finding out which ones work the best for you. I mean, some people love exercise. Some people like therapy. Some people like prayer and meditation. Um, you know, there's all kinds of strategies that we can help to soothe and um, teach us healthy emotion regulation so that when we get in a situation and we need to access it, that we can, that we can easily access that uh, regulation. And when we feel like raging or we feel like, um, you know, driving over to where our dealer used to be, that we can, you know, take a deep breath and use those skills and let the feeling pass. Yeah. And some of them we've already identified. They're, they're necessary components in, in some of the first seven or so. Huh? Yes. Yeah. yeah. You're not going to get very far without those. Right. And these nine principles, mm -hmm. they all work together. It's not like right. you do one yeah. and then you're done and then you do two. Yeah. They all work together because if I'm not practicing mindfulness, uh, you know, at, at number eight or, you know, when I'm giving myself permission, I have to be mindful. I have to be paying attention. So they all work together. Great. Okay. Well, listen, um, uh, I do like to keep these to about an hour or so. Uh, so we have uh, uh, gone a little bit over, which is good, which is good. I think, I think there was some uh, really, really good material that we uh, touched on, Laura. So I, I want to thank you for uh, sharing your wisdom and uh, knowledge with us uh, today. It, it was very, very uh, helpful uh, information. And you're going to come back next week. And we're going to dive into some of the strategies uh, for dealing with these emotions and uh, kind of building on what we've learned in the first two episodes. Hey? Yes, I Sounds will be good. here. Yeah. All right. I will, too. Be back in Austin by then. So, uh, so I want to thank you guys for listening. I, I hope you did find uh, this helpful. I'm continuing to grow up as we, as we go along week by week. So I, <laughs> I'm benefiting along with you all. And, uh, and next week, uh, we'll, we'll dive a little bit deeper. So thank you, Laura, for uh, sharing with us. And thank you guys for listening. If you did find it helpful, uh, let a friend know about this. Subscribe and do all the crazy things you're supposed to do to help uh, promote this thing. I think a lot of this information is really important for people in 12-step recovery. So uh, do I your agree. part. Yeah, do your part to help get the word out, okay? So thanks Thank for listening, you. guys. Thank All you right. again, Laura. Take care. God bless, and uh, keep coming back. Thank you so much. Righto.